Thank you, Mia. Welcome to each of you. We're so happy to have you here. It's a beautiful day, and we have to enjoy every gorgeous day that we have because the sun won't shine forever in this part of the country. You know, every part of our worship is aimed at drawing people's hearts upward to heaven. And I want you to think about each part of our program, not just that the preacher is going to preach and we listen to that, but you know, the music, all the words of the music and the various aspects are all intended to make us think about God and to set both an emotional uh, um, stage as well as um, you know, a verbal understanding of what is um, what we want you to hear. We welcome the visitors. We welcome those that are listening online. There are many people who are absent today because they're out with the Pathfinders. I'll mention that in a minute, a little bit more. And I would like any of you that feel need of prayer to just ask one of us elders afterwards and we will be glad to meet with you somewhere close by here and pray with you. So come to us. Also today is a potluck day. Potluck occurs the second, third, and fourth Sabbaths of the month. And next week we'll have potluck again. There is a little schedule out by the welcome desk if anybody wants to remember what the emphasis is. So next week, just so you know, it'll be the baked potato bar. So be sure to be here if you can. And you are all welcome. Even if you didn't bring your food or didn't know about this, uh, come, hopefully we have plenty of food. So we have many people missing, I mentioned. They are camping out at uh, Daroga State Park. The Pathfinders and all their supportive teams and um, leaders. So we have a little video that uh, is going to be played now. And after that, we will have the call to worship. <clears throat> Happy Sabbath, church. Happy Sabbath. I know that it's, we are not as we usually are, but we can do better. Happy Sabbath, church. Happy Sabbath. There we go. Okay, shall we all stand as we praise our God with him 260. Two, six, Yeah. 
our Lord and Heavenly Father, we humbly come before your throne, your throne of grace and mercy, because you are an amazing and wonderful God. There is none like you, because you came down and died for all of us. As we are here worshiping you, praising your name, we ask you to be with us. Send your Holy Spirit to fill us so that we can do all things according to your will. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So we're going to continue our praise and worship with him 341. To God be the glory. It's not about you. It's not about this praise team. But we have to send uh, all the glory to God.
is so faithful all we need to do is sur surrender it all to Christ amen, amen. 309 
time for the offering. The deacons could come forward. This offering is for the local combined budget. And uh, we often think about it as kind of, you know, the mundane things of running a church, but it's actually got a lot of really important things in it. And actually a very huge proportion, nearly 50%, goes to our school across the parking lot. Super important, $100,000 a year goes to our school. Now, you know, the school is a huge, important outreach for this church, probably the most important. And you think about those children coming up, they are our future of our church. And anything we can do to improve that school and its performance and reach more children is really important. Uh, it's, it's a community school too. You think of how many children from our community go there that aren't just members of our church. So it's a very important outreach. And that is um, what our, our offering today is going for. Now also a portion of the combined budget does also go to the academy and college matching funds. And we, aren't, we didn't expect so many kids to need that matching money this year. We didn't know about it really. And so we're kind of short on the funds there. So if you mark your bulletin for some extra money to that matching fund, this will help the kids who are going to college and academy who've applied for those funds. And you know, again, our support in those areas is super important. It sends a message to the kids. It sends a message to the families of those children that the church is behind them going to church school. And I went to church school through college. You know, it was a profound impact on my life, I know. I mean, certainly my family was a big impact, but the church and the church uh, schools that we operate are very important. So I would uh, put in a plea for you to put in an extra dollar for the matching fund as well as uh, contributing to the combined budget as we support our school. Let's pray. Dear Father, thank you for the chance to be here. Thank you that we have the needs that we, uh, that we really need covered pretty much here in this country. We are very fortunate compared to people around the world. We would like to come to you with open hands and give back what we can to you. Please bless these funds, each penny, each dollar, that it will go to its intended use and help the children of our church to be educated well. In your name, amen.
Hello, good morning, church. Our scripture reading this morning is 2 Kings chapter 13, verses 14 through 19. When Elijah was in his last illness, King Jeshup of Israel visited him and wept over him. My father, my father, I see the chariots and the charioteers. And Elijah said to him, Take a bow and arrows. So he took a bow and arrows. And then he said to the king of Israel, Draw the bow, and he drew it. And Elijah laid his hands on the king's hands, opened the window eastward, and he opened it. Then Elijah said, Shoot, and he shot. And he said, the Lord's arrow of victory, the arrow of victory over Syria. For you shall fight the Syrians in a pack until you have made an end to them. And he said to take the arrows and he took them. And he said to the king of Israel, strike the ground with them. And he struck the ground three times and stopped. Then the man of God was angry with him. He said, you should have struck the ground five or six times. Then you would have struck down Syria until you had made an end of it. But now you will strike down Syria only three times. As far as you're able, please kneel for prayer. Father God, we have many things to thank you for, and among those, we thank you for keeping us all safe throughout this past week and allowing us to meet here again this Sabbath and worship and praise you together. We thank you and praise you for your character and your attitude towards us, Lord. We thank you for your compassion towards us, your graciousness. We thank you that you're slow to anger and that you're abounding in love and faithfulness towards us. We thank you, Lord, that you maintain love for thousands and you forgive wickedness, rebellion, and sin, yet you do not leave the guilty unpunished. We ask, Lord, that you please let us find favor in your eyes and that you go with us wherever we go. We ask, Lord, that although we are stubborn, that you forgive us our wickedness and our sin. Please take us as your inheritance, Lord. Make a covenant with us and do wonders among us so that the people around us will see how awesome the work is that you do. Please, Lord, help us be faithful to you and active for you. Help us not forget the widows, the orphans, the strangers, the homeless, and those in prison. Help us remember how important it is to you to take care of the disadvantaged among us. And Lord, please put your blessing on this day. Help us keep your Sabbath day holy and not only do what we please or speak idle words, but may we seek to please you on this your holy day. May we call the Sabbath a delight and honor it so that we might find our joy in you, Lord. These things we ask in Jesus' name, amen.
Because our kids, it's time for the children's story. So you can come up, and as you come up, you can collect the dollar bills and put them in the schoolhouse. Hello, boys and girls. So, to start my story, I have a quick question. How many of you have ever broken a bone? <laughs> uh-huh. And let me ask you another question. Did it hurt when you broke your bone? Yes, a lot. Uh-huh, yes. So, for this story, I will tell you the time that I broke my bone when I was in seventh grade. So what happened was I was at the park with my dad and my family, and we were playing tag. And then as I was running, I tripped, and I tried to catch my fall with my right hand, but I landed wrong. And then I heard a snap. <laughs> and then once I came to on the ground, I looked at my arm, and it was kind of bent a little bit. And I said, oh, something is not right. So then I called my dad and said, Dad, I think something's wrong with my arm. And then my dad came over and he said, Son, your arm is broken. And so, with my broken arm, I had to carry it like this, because it was broken. And then we went to the hospital. And then the, the nurse checked on it. She said, yep, it's definitely broken. So she put a splint on it. And then we waited and waited. And then we went and took an x-ray. And the doctor said, yep, it's definitely broken. And it was a clean break, meaning that both of the bones in my arm was broken. So the doctor said, you're going to stay here overnight, and then in the morning, we're going to have surgery on you, and then we're going to fix your arm. So I slept in the hospital overnight, and then in the morning, the doctor came back, and then they had a surgery on me. So they put me to sleep again, and then they put two cuts in my arm, one for each of the bones, and they put a metal plate in each of the bones, and they put metal screws in each of the bones so that they could be connected, all right? And then after the surgery was complete, they put my arm in a cast. And as you can see in the picture, that's me in my cast in seventh grade. So for the rest of the summer, well, for most of the summer, I was in a cast. And so I'm right-handed, and since my right hand's in a cast, I had to learn how to do things with my left hand. So I had to learn how to brush my teeth with my left hand, how to eat with my left hand, how to write with my left hand, and do other things with my left hand. So that was pretty interesting. And also, since my arm was still healing in the cast, there was also a lot of pain. And sometimes it would get itchy, but since it's in the cast, I can't really scratch it. So I just had to deal with it. And it was pretty annoying. And the thing that I found out was that Sometimes when there was too much pain, 
or maybe it was too itchy, I would talk to God. I would say, God, thank you for all the blessings that you've given to me, and I pray that you can help me with this pain. And then I found out that the more that I talked to God, the more that my pain started to go away. And so for the next couple of weeks, I continued to talk to God. And then finally, we went back to the doctors. The doctors cut open my cast and said, Alfred, your arm is good to go. And so the main point of my story and the main lesson I want to tell you guys is that sometimes in life, bad things can happen. Sometimes you can break a bone. Sometimes other bad things can happen. But even in these bad things can happen to you, the main thing is that God is always there for you, and you can always talk to him, and he will always comfort you, and he will lead you through to the end, to a better and bright future. All right? So let's have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, please be with all these young people up here, and please help them to know that you are their best friend, and that they can always talk to you, and that you will always comfort them in their time of need. Bless them and keep them safe. In your name I pray, amen. You guys can go to your seats. Just like Alfred has said, uh, we have to depend on God. There's this other writer in 1876 who also had the same idea that it was a time of so much conflict and crying and tears, such a time as we are having right now. We have got so much tears and so many conflicts, but that writer told us that there's only one thing that we have to do is to hide in thee. So the praise team are going to give you a special song, um, Him 5 to 5, Hiding in Thee. My soul in its conflicts and sorrows fly. So sinful, so weary, thy light would I be. The press rock of ages, I'm hiding in thee. I have been my rest. 
Thank you. I'm privileged to introduce Elder Bing, our conference president, as our speaker today. And um, he didn't want to tell me too much about himself. <laughs> Found out a little bit about his kids. But he was a pastor in Kansas and Nebraska for, uh, um, what, 15 years? And then uh, became vice president here of our conference for 15. And then he's been conference president now for eight years. Seems like that's kind of flown along. Seems like the years do roll by, don't they? Wilma, his wife, is in the fourth seat there in the, near the center. Thank you, Wilma, for being here with us. Wilma's an important person. She's the associate superintendent of education, and she's actually a pastor, too. She was a pastor for 17 years. So thanks for being here with us and for what you do, too, Wilma. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. It's good to see you this morning. Yes, I like to talk about my kids. I like to talk about my grandkids. Well, grandkid. <laughs> Maybe someday they'll be the plural. But I have to convince my other children to do that. So my wife told me that I need to be quiet about those kind of things. So <laughs> it is good to see you this morning. I enjoyed very much the worship service so far. I loved what uh, was stated earlier in that every act that we have done so far is worship. It's not just about what we're about to open our Bible and study. But I enjoyed the music very much and everything else about it. It's good to be here and to uh, be a part of your worship service, to see your children off camping what a great thing, great memories there as well. You know, this week I did something that uh, I do every fall. Some of you may do the same thing. I, uh, I went out to the garage, to my place where I keep all the supplies that I work to, or use to work on my car. And, uh, and so I went out there and found a particular bottle of stuff that I really like and uh, I took that bottle along with some rags out to my car and to my wife's car because I believe that at this time of the year it's important to do this as I put Rain-X on the windshield. Do you know what Rain-X is? Yeah, some of you know what Rain-X is. And if you haven't discovered Rain-X, you should, all right? Because you go out and you put it, the Rain-X on your window and then when it rains, the wind, you hardly ever have to, I mean, if you've got a good, nice batch of rain -X on your window, on your windshield, when you're driving in this area, in this area, the rain just wicks right off. You hardly have to use your, your wiper blades, and it's just a wonderful thing. So I'm out there, and I put this all on my car. I put it on my wife's car, because I know that rain is coming, right? Rain is coming. In fact, it was the very next day I went out, got in my car, and there was dew on the windshield. One little flick of the switch, it was all gone, just rolled right off. We like to be able to see clearly. We like to be able to see what's around us. We like to be able to um, know what's in front of us. And I think that's really important as we think about our title of today's talk. It has to do with looking out the window looking out the windows and knowing what's outside is really, really important. You know, we did this uh, story that our sweet young lady read recently is a story that you've all read before. But it's a, it's a story of getting close to the end of um, Elisha's life. And Elisha, you know, it says was, was, was dying. And he's, as he's dying... The king comes along, and the king was not a religious guy, but he realized that there was an era that was changing. And he wondered, who's going to be our leader from a religious perspective? Even though he was really an evil guy. He was not a nice guy, this king. But he goes and he sees Elisha, and Elisha does something very, very interesting. But he, he, he goes there, and, and he's dying, and Elisha, you know, 
we got to think about Elisha just for a moment. Because Elisha, in my mind, had watched his mentor. He had watched his mentor, Elijah, right up until the very moment that he left this earth. He had watched him. In fact, is he had asked in a very special way, he had asked, can I have, can I have a double portion of your spirit? Elijah had walked by him in the field, throw the mantle on him, and, and he, had, he, he was transformed at that moment, and he started following Elisha everywhere he went. And he was doing everything he could to, to learn everything he could from his mentor. He knew God had called him. And he knew that he needed a double portion, and he wanted a double portion of what Elijah had. Now, can you imagine... Elisha actually did get a double portion of his spirit. And he, and he, he, he had that. And all through his, his ministry, he actually performed so many more miracles through the power of God. So many more miracles from the time he took that mantle after Elijah had gone up, he smacked the water, walked across on dry ground. He had performed way more miracles than Elijah ever had done. I mean, the axe head had floated. Remember that story? When it was the last time you saw an axe head pop up to the, to the top. He had made poison soup good by throwing in a few extra things. He had made the widow's oil flow till he ran out of oil jars. He had raised the dead, and the list goes on and on, all because he had placed himself fully and completely. He had surrendered all, like the song said. He had surrendered all to be able to, to say, I am going to give everything I have to Jesus, to God. Now he was dying. Now, Let's just be human just for a second. Let's just be human just for a second. He had seen his mentor, who had not done hardly any of those things, go straight to heaven. Do you think that Elijah just had maybe a little twinge of, how come I'm dying and not going straight to heaven? I wondered about that. I'm, I'm going to ask Elijah that because I know my human perspective is like, when's the chariot coming for me? You know what I'm saying? I, I would have wanted to know, when's that chariot going to swoop down and, and, and where's the guy that I'm laying the mantle on? Because you don't see that story be played out at all again. And, I, and I've wondered about that. And so that's just a little side thing, but I'm just wondering, did, did he have that thought there on his deathbed? I think he did. But maybe not. Maybe, maybe he's better than I would be. I don't know. Probably was. But I love the fact that instead we have this story. Instead of a flaming chariot, we have this story. Instead of, a, instead of him going and riding off into the sunset, we have this story that is very instructive for us. And as the scripture says, it says the king comes and he's wanting to know the future. And as the king comes and wants to know the future, he says, let's, let's talk about bows and arrows. And so go get me a bow and arrow. Open the east window. Notch up, that, notch up that arrow. And Elisha, even in his weakened state, he takes his hands and he puts them on the king's hands who had drawn back the, bro, the bow to kind of tell him, hey, God is with you. God is willing to be with you in this battle. God is wanting to be part of the solution. Even though you're an evil king, just turn yourself over to him because God is wanting to be part of the solution of the battles that you're facing today. He's willing to put his hand over yours to face those issues of the day. Now shoot out that east window. And by the way, the reason he was shooting east is because that's where the battles were coming from. You read about what was happening and where those attacks on Israel was happening at the time, and they were coming from the east. And so he said, shoot the arrow out the east. And so the arrow was released, and Elisha says, you're going to win the battle over that king. You'll have victory. And the next part of the story is rather interesting because it says, take the rest of the arrows. And so, you know, take them and pound them on the ground. And, and, and some people say, and some commentators say, he has told them to, you know, take them and shoot the bunch of arrows into the ground. And others says, pound them on the ground. I don't really care which one it is. I tend to think that he was pounding them on the ground like this. But whatever it was, it says, take and pound them on the ground. And I believe, you know, the king is feeling a little bit self-conscious. Like, what kind of silliness is this? What kind, of, what kind of stupid request is this? And so he takes and he kind of, you know, in my mind, I wonder if he kind of just tentatively taps him a little bit at first. 
Like, I don't know what the, what the old man is doing. Has he lost his marbles? Is he dying there in the bed? You know, what's going on here? Is he getting senile? Why is he doing this? And so maybe, maybe he pounded him. Maybe he did. Maybe he just tentatively, and it's like, I don't know what's going on here. Either way, he pats it. He, he only does it three times. And it feels weird banging arrows on the ground. Why would you do that? Let me ask you a question. Have you ever felt God calls you to do something and you're looking around and goes, I hope nobody's watching? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And like, this is really strange. Why, why am I getting this impression? I had somebody call me one time, and I, I love the fact that they did this. And they called me, and they were kind of sheepish. And they says, Pastor, um, we, we, we're not sure why we're doing this. I'm like, what are you doing? Well, we just woke up and felt the need that we needed to call you up and pray for you. <laughs> What's so weird about that? I mean, you know, what was cool thing is that there were some heavy decisions that we happened to be made that made. And, you know, and this guy is like, uh, you know, I don't know if I'm losing my mind, but, you know, maybe I just ate the wrong thing and I had this dream that I should call and pray for you, but uh, I'm going to go ahead and do it. And praise God they did, Right? You know, I don't know what's going on in this king's mind, but he, you know, he did what he did. And I'm telling you, sometimes God tells you to do some things that just seem weird. I remember one time I was pastoring in Kansas, and I had this whole list of things I was going to do that day. I had written them all down. I knew exactly the order of service, the order of, of my day was going to be. And I hop in my car to go for, to do all these pastoral visits that I was going to do. And, you know, you know, it was a fairly decent-sized city. Wichita, Kansas is, you know, 500,000 people or so. And so I had, I had outlined it so that I would do it in a route that made sense. So I wasn't just running hither, thither, and yon, right? Wouldn't you know it, as I get in my car, I'm starting to drive to appointment number one. And I'm like, this, this doesn't right. I need to go to this other place first. I'm like, that just doesn't make sense. That's like way out of the way. And then I'm going to have to double back and do this and do that and whatever. But I went ahead and did it. Didn't make sense. Didn't follow any kind of reasonable map, you know, whatever. But as I reflected, I remember as I reflected at the end of that day, that if I had followed my route, which made sense, I would have missed every single one because they wouldn't have been there. Because the one I went to first, the one I, the pastoral visit I visited, well, yeah, you just caught me, Pastor. I'm just getting ready to leave town, but thanks for stopping by. I needed you to pray with me. And this visit and that visit. And the whole day went like that. And I thought to myself, I'm sure glad I listened. So sometimes you're asked to do things that seem silly. It seems like it's the wrong way. And you may not even do it with complete gusto, like this king. The king only taps him three times, and the king and Elisha was not a happy prophet. Because lying there on that deathbed, he showed sparks of the fiery man that he had been in his life. In verse 19, where he says, you should have kept going. You should have pounded the ground five, six times. Why did you stop? Now you're only going to win the victory three times. And you go back and you look at history, and they only won three battles in the rest of the time. Their enemies won. Elisha knew even though this was an evil king, he still, this was my people, his was God's people, and he wanted God's people to be free of their enemies. I thought a lot about this story. And I believe that we should maybe take a look at the windows in our lives. Maybe we should take a look at the windows that we have in our own personal lives. And I think that the question we have to ask ourselves, are you looking out the window and what is outside of your window? What battles are you facing and where are they coming from? What's outside of our windows? And I think the very first place we have to start with as we have to start with the windows of our souls. What do we see outside the windows of our souls? And, and I, I, I just love, I mean, I, I didn't tell them what songs to choose for the praise team. Well, when I was sitting here reflecting on the front row here, this song, this I Surrender All, you know, it's really easy to hum that tune. It's real easy to sing that song. Have you done it, though? 
Come on. Let's reflect on that. Have we done it? Have we totally sold ourselves out on Jesus Christ? Have we really said, I surrender every aspect of my life, my, my talents, my, my, my time, and yes, even my treasure, have we given it all to Jesus? You know, Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, chapter, chapter 2 and chapter 3, he talks about it. I'd encourage you to read it because he talks about the two kinds of Christians in every church. And this is going to get personal. But he talks about the two kinds of Christians in every church. He says there are Christians that are in the church only, and then there are Christians who are filled with the Holy Spirit. You hear what I said? There are Christians who come because maybe it's part of your culture. Maybe it's part of the way you were raised. There was Christians who come and they do their thing on Sabbath morning and maybe not even on Sabbath afternoon like my sister prayed for a faithful Sabbath keeping. Maybe there was people, there's Christians like that, but they're not truly filled with the Holy Spirit. When I think about, I think about this concept of Pentecost and this whole idea of Pentecost 2025, and I, if you haven't heard about it, I'd be glad to tell you more, but this whole concept that the entire North American division says it's time for all of us to be praying for the Holy Spirit. It's time for all of us to unite like the people in the, in the, in the early church in Acts chapter 2. It's time for all of us to unite and say, let us pray for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Because after the outpouring of the Holy Spirit came, there was this time of, present, of presentation that also took place. And this time of people then joining the church and saying, I want to be part of something. I'm committing myself, my entire self, to God. And believe you me, I know that's a battle. Our souls are under attack all the time. We have media now of all sorts that attack us from all angles. Social media is the worst thing, I think, in some respects as far as attack. Now, I think there's a lot of good to be done with social media. Don't get me wrong. But so many times we're bombarded by social media, by societal demands. Right now, we're bombarded by political jousting on all sides. People don't seem to be able to be friends with people who don't believe the way they do politically. And I'm sorry, that's a sin. That's just what that is. If we cannot truly be friends and care about those who may be different than us politically, we should be ashamed and we should go to our knees and pray. No matter what, we should be able to be friends with them. We're bombarded by temptations on every side. It's a daily battle. But the good news is, is that there's this thing called this Holy Spirit that was promised by Jesus, and it was not just promised to us. And believe you me, you may heard me preach about the Holy Spirit here before, but it's something that I'm passionate about because it's a gift that God says in Luke chapter 11 that if you ask for this gift, it's not like it's a question mark whether you'll get it. You will get it. It's promised in Luke chapter 11. It's promised right there, and it says, I love this, you know, we've all read it, but I've just got to read it again. If a son asks for bread from any father among you, will he give you a stone? This is Luke 11, 9 through 11. Or if he asks for a fish, will he give him a serpent instead of a fish? Or if he asks for an egg, will he offer him a scorpion? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask? I started reflecting on the, how much more there are in the Bible. And they all talk about, um, there's so many how much more is in the Bible, and all of them point to how much greater God is than us. But how much more will God, he wants to give us the Holy Spirit. He wants this church here in Everett. He wants this conference to be filled with the Holy Spirit. He wants the windows of our souls as we start reflecting. The first window is us. He wants us to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And he promises that it will happen. The Christ Object Lesson, when it talks about the Holy Spirit, it says God does not ask does not say, ask once and you shall receive. He bids us ask unwearingly, persist in prayer, and the persistent asking brings the petitioner into a more earnest attitude and gives him an increased desire to receive the things for which he asks. Let me tell you something. If the enemy of God is lurking outside the windows of our soul and destroying our prayer lives, destroying our scripture reading, destroying our family worship time, destroying our personal walks with Jesus, this is the first window that we should be focused on. And we need to take an arrow and we, sh we need to shoot and we need to pound the ground with vigor 
until the victory is won. That's the first window. And that's why I think that Pentecost 2025 and our, and our whole division is, is focusing on this to say it's time to be praying about that. It's time for all of us to be praying about that. Then there's the windows of your own neighborhood. Can I confess a little bit about Wilma and I? Okay, just, Wil- just me, not Wilma. I'll leave her out of it. We live in a small little neighborhood just south of Auburn, Washington. It has uh, about 30 houses in it. Small HOA, which is a whole other story. You've probably heard me talk about that before. But you know, during, but our, 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 our neighborhood is probably like your neighborhood. Everybody's busy, and everybody come, when they time come home, we hit the garage door opener, we put the garage in the car, in, in the garage, uh, the car in the garage. Let me get this right. We get the, you get the, you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> we put the car in the garage, and we hit the switch, and we go in and never darken the outside again unless it's in our backyard with the fences all around and nobody can get to us. Is that that your story? Come on, that's not just me. And that's us. Except for then something happened during COVID and everybody started staying at home. We're all working from house. And so guess what we start doing? We take breaks and we start walking in the neighborhood. And I learned about this one. And I learned about that one. And I still now, still walk in the neighborhood. And I've learned about this, this neighbor and what he does and, and this person. And sadly, I'm thinking to myself, we've had three neighbors who've all gone through divorce and we did nothing to help and comfort them. Just, just being confession time here. It's okay. But now I'm starting to get to know, we're starting to get to know this one and that one and and the other, and I don't know where it's going to go, and it's, it's a long road. But what about your neighborhood? Do you know your neighbors? We have one that just moved in across the street like three weeks, three, three months ago. Found out that she actually moved from Granite Falls right up here. I don't know how they ended up down south where we're at, but, you know, there they are. Three weeks before they were supposed to close, she found out she was terribly sick with really bad cancer. So we've started to put them on our prayer list and, and go see them. She won't even answer the door because she's immuno, Im, immunocompromised. And so we, my, my wife makes things or takes things and leaves them on the front porch. And she comes out and she'll say, hey, thank you for that. So glad, you know, but we don't want to get too close. Talk to the mother-in-law. I said, keep praying for them because they used to be Christians, but, you know, they don't really have much belief anymore. I don't know where it's going to go, but I love the fact that now I'm starting to think about the windows right outside my own house, which I should have been doing all along. I'm just being, I'm confessing my, my soul here for a moment. And I pray for her. Her name is Lindsay, by the way. I pray for her daily. Write her name in my prayer journal and say, be with Lindsay. Help heal her. But most of all, Bring her back to you. Bring her back to you. And if you don't heal her, that's fine. But heal her soul. Heal her soul. What about your neighborhood? Maybe you have single parents raising kids by themselves, people struggling with cancer in your own neighborhoods, people struggling with unemployment. In this neighborhood, you may have people who are on strike in your neighborhood. And whether you agree or disagree with that, it's still a stressful time for them. Plant those seeds. Be praying for those outside, because that's where the real battles are taking place for men's hearts and minds. Much greater than the battles that are happening in our world. We live in a world torn by war, but the bigger wars are what's happening in your neighborhood. That's the big war. And we can all make a difference. What about the city of Everett? Do you know about your city? I read about your city this week. I did. It's very interesting. Do you know why it's named Everett, by the way? Anybody know the reasons why you have the name of Everett? Ha! I know something you don't know. (laughs) So I'm reading about Everett this week. I'm thinking to myself, how do you know? 
You know, there was a guy named uh, Rockefeller. Have you ever heard of him? He helped invest in a bunch of stuff to help build up the city of Everett, right? And there was a bunch of investors, and they had this whole story. But one of the investors had this, like, 13 or 14, 15-year-old kid whose name was Everett. And he was known for having a, prodig- a, a, very, a very aggressive appetite. You know about this story. Yeah? You've heard it. You've read it, right? And so they named, because they were amused by this kid's appetite, you now have the city of Everett's. <laughs> now you know some history about Everett's. Everett used to be native land, and uh, you all signed a decree, or they signed a, a thing and took away from the natives, and they moved north. Now you have 111,348 people. Your crime rate is higher than other places. Your poverty rate is 14.4%. The largest demographic that is living in poverty are females from the ages of 25 to 34. Did you know that? Do you know why? Probably because they're newly divorced. That's why. 52% of your population is male. 57% is white. But there's so many other population, there's so many other demographic groups that, that are here. 19% is the next biggest one of Hispanics. 11% is divorced. And that's just a few things outside your window. But if you study the history of the, if you study the history of the Christian church, the Christian church from a very early time was starting to look outside of people of their window and says, we need to start making an impact in the areas in which we live. The earliest hospitals ever in the history of the world were started by Christianity. Because they said, we have to make a difference in our community. They says, we've got to make a difference in poverty. I mean, you look at the poverty, you know, the, you know, Paul was known for going around and says, hey, there's some poor people back over there, we should help them. And he's collecting an offering to take back and do that because they looked outside the windows and they says, how can we help the people outside our window? We got to pound those arrows in that location. We got to keep making an impact. And whether it be the poverty rate or the rich people that live high and lifted up and above ever, all the rest of us, whoever it is, you, we have to, as Christians, be looking outside the window and not just be some, become so insular that we just look at ourselves. But look outside the window of our towns. Look outside the windows of our communities. Look outside and say, where do we need to shoot the arrows? Where is God telling us to shoot the arrow? And how many times is he telling us to pound the arrows on the ground? He says, pound it until the victory is done. Look outside the window. Jesus said in his first sermon in Luke chapter 4, that he'd come to preach good things, good news to the poor, proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight to the blind, to release the oppressed and proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And in our pastoral prayer today, the, one of the beautiful parts of our service today, we prayed, help us not to forget them. Help us not to forget them because that is what's outside our windows. Matthew chapter 25, when they separate the sheep and the goats, what does it say? The people who are committed are the ones who looked outside the window. And they went and they, went and they visited the poor. They clothed those who needed clothing. They made an impact in their community. And so my question is this. Where are the battles that need to be fought in the city of Everett? Where is the, na- where is the arrows need to be shot? And where do they p- need to be pounded? You know, as I travel all over this conference, I'm at a different church every Sabbath of my life. I was at a newly, newly planted church plant last week, made up totally of Ken- Kenyans. What a great Sabbath that was. I enjoyed it so much. I was late to my next appointment Sabbath afternoon because I was having so much fun. Beautiful, beautiful people. But you know, as I talked to them, I thought to myself, I know the battles that some of them are fighting because almost every one of them had left major parts of their family back in Africa. And they're here by themselves. Fathers here without their children for years at a time trying to give a better life. (laughs) 
So what's outside our window? I go around and I hear about these churches that are doing day camps. I hear about different things that are happening around one of our smallest churches. Smallest churches recently held an event for a thousand people. Only 60 people in church, but they managed to figure out how to reach a thousand people in a community event because they saw that that is a need in their community. Our, one of our fastest growing churches in this conference is Ukrainian. Over 400 and some people attend, and that church is only three years old. It's probably the largest church that we have in attendance. Why? Because they looked outside the window and says, here's all these refugees that are coming to our territory, running from war, scared, that they need a spiritual home. Many of them were Adventists over there, but others were brought because they, like, hey, here's a church community that they can reach out to that takes care of them. What's outside your window? Are you pounding, are you pounding the arrows until the victory is done? Recently, my wife and I came back from Gillette, the Camp Ree. There was over 900 Pathfinders from Washington Conference there, and we had had a wonderful time helping serve food to them and different things like that. But something happens on the way back from driving, because we drove over. When we get back, and we get out and look at our car, and it's got a whole bunch of dead bugs all over the windshield. You don't get that much around here, because on this side of the mountains, we don't have those. Our grill was covered with dead bugs. The windshield was all splattered. But let me ask you something. Did those little things stop us from getting where we were going? We still got here, didn't we? You see, when you look out the window, you can get all hung up on the little spots there of bugs. And you get distracted by that, and you don't get to where the victory of where you're supposed to be going is. I'm saying look past the little bugs. Look past those things that mess up your windows. Even if you don't have rain -X on it, still look past all of that and get to where God is calling you to go. Get to where he's saying, hey, this is a place I need you to serve. Whether that's you individually or whether it's the whole church collectively, be praying about that. And say, God, help us to look outside the window. Help us to shoot arrows out there and help us to pound them until the victory is won. And that is my prayer for you today. Shall we all stand as we sing our last song, Jesus is Coming Again? Two, one, three.
Amen. Wasn't that amazing? Just want a reminder, if you slipped in a little bit late uh, this morning, that we do have a fellowship meal right after the church service, and especially if you're visiting or guests here, we really would encourage you to stick around and get a bite to eat. It'll be downstairs. Just follow the stairwell down in your nose, and it'll lead you right to the spot. <laughs> Let's bow our heads together. Heavenly Father, what a, what a joy and delight it has been to be here to come into your presence uh, for worship and praise and thankfulness, joy, and even to lay our burdens upon upon your throne. And we've done that today. So now we ask you to send us out with the power of your Holy Spirit and to help us, Lord, to uh, look out those windows and uh, see what you have uh, for each of us there. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.